Hi Bobcats! In this video, we're going to figure out how to identify the dominant intermolecular force in a sample of a substance, and then also look at several different ways that questions on this topic get asked. Our objectives um, are still bringing in the types of intermolecular forces and distinguishing them from bonds and relating them to properties. But now we're also adding that we're going to identify the dominant intermolecular force. The process of identifying the dominant intermolecular force in a compound is basically calculatus eliminatus. Um, we're going to start with whatever the strongest force is and see if that's present in the molecule. If it's not, then we'll move to the next strongest force and we keep working our way down um, until finally we're at London dispersion forces because regardless of what the substance is, London is always present. It's only the dominant force if all of the stronger forces are missing. So in taking a look at this flow chart, um, the first thing we want to try to identify is the ion dipole force. And the ion dipole force is present if, in looking at the substances, you have an ion plus a polar molecule. The ion will stick out like a sore thumb because it will be a charged particle. You'll have something that has a plus sign on it or a minus sign or it'll be listed as an ionic compound, which is a metal plus a nonmetal, or you identify a polyatomic ion like nitrate, phosphate, those sorts of things. Okay, so if ion dipole is not present, um, the answer to this question is no, then the next thing you look for is hydrogen bonding. Do you have a hydrogen atom in the compound that's bonded to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine? If the answer is yes, it's hydrogen bonding. If the answer is no, then we need to check for dipole-dipole. And if the molecule is polar, then the dominant intermolecular force is dipole-dipole. Otherwise, by calculatus eliminatus, London dispersion forces will be the dominant intermolecular force. So as an example, you might be asked on a quiz or a test to determine the dominant uh, intermolecular force. Um, it might be phrased like this, what type of intermolecular force would be most significant between molecules of, and then you're given four different compounds here to characterize. Um, so in order to go through and do this, um, we need our flow chart. So there we go, there's our flow chart. Um, so the, um, the first compound that we're asked to analyze is methanol, CH3OH. If we were to look at the structure of methanol, there's a central carbon atom, there's an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, um, and then that carbon still has another three hydrogens. So the CH3 part is this uh, carbon and the three hydrogens, and then the OH is this OH group attached. So looking at our flow chart, do we have an ion plus a polar molecule? Well, no, there's nothing ionic here. So we move down to the next part, and it asks, are hydrogen atoms bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine? And the answer there is yes. We have them right here. So if the answer to that question is yes, then the dominant intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. So for methanol, it is hydrogen bonding. Now let's take a look at the next question. Um, this is dimethyl ether. Um, this is um, an organic structural formula. The CH3 at the start is what we had at the start of the previous compounds. So we'll have a C with three hydrogens. Remember when we're drawing these Lewis dot structures from 1341, that carbon likes to make four bonds. The fourth bond will be to an oxygen, and then that oxygen is also connected to a CH3 group. So when we are looking at this structure um, and we're asking, is there an ion plus a polar molecule? Mm, nope. Um, and then are hydrogen atoms bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine? Mm, nope. All of the hydrogens are bonded to um, carbons. Then is it a polar molecule? 
Well, this might be a little tricky to see. That central oxygen atom, to satisfy its octet, it actually has two more lone pairs, which I neglected to draw originally. And so if we look at that central oxygen atom, it does not have all of its domains being identical. So that means it is a polar molecule. We've got lone pairs for one type of domain and single bonds to carbon for the other type of domain. So this guy is a polar molecule. And so it means that dipole-dipole is the dominant intermolecular force. I should probably, for consistency, draw a box around hydrogen bonding up there. Okay, the next compound is CH3Cl. Um, I'm going to go ahead and draw that down here. So we have three hydrogens and one chlorine. Okay, so is there an ion plus a polar molecule? Nope, so it's not ion dipole. Do we have hydrogens bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine? Nope. Is this a polar molecule? Yes, this is polar because when we look at that central carbon atom, it has two distinct domains, a single bond to chlorine and three single bonds to hydrogen. So those are two distinct domains. So this guy will be dipole, dipole as well. And then last but not least, I'm running out of room to draw structures, so I'm going to move to the upper corner. We have CCl4. So there's a carbon with bonds to four chlorines. And um, so we have, um, um, looking at that, oh, well, whoops, sorry. I started jumping to the answer. We need to go through our flow chart. Do we have an ion plus a polar molecule? Nope, there's just one thing here. Are hydrogen atoms bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine? Nope, there are no hydrogens in here. Is it a polar molecule? Nope. When you look at that central carbon atom, all four domains are identical. They are all single bonds to chlorine, so it is nonpolar. So that means London dispersion forces are the only intermolecular force that's present, and so that will be our dominant intermolecular force by calculatus eliminatus. In the previous slide, as we were identifying the dominant intermolecular force, we were only looking at a single molecule of a substance. So keep in mind that what we're really trying to identify is what's going on between one molecule and the next, like here with that hydrogen bonding or over here with London dispersion forces. And remember that even though one force may be the dominant intermolecular force, London dispersion forces are always present, and different portions of the molecules may have different forces going on. So one part may be hydrogen bonded, and another part may be dipole-dipole, and the whole thing can be London dispersion. In which of these substances is hydrogen bonding likely to play an important role in determining physical properties? For hydrogen bonding to be present, you've got to have a hydrogen atom that's attached to either a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. With that criteria, we can eliminate A and D because these substances do not have a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. Um, looking at methyl fluoride, we're going to have our CH3 group, and whoops, that should be a bond, and the carbon is also bonded to a fluorine, so there's no connection between the hydrogen and the fluorine, so methyl fluoride's not going to work. That just leaves hydrazine, and hydrazine is drawn there as a structural formula, so we have two hydrogens attached to a nitrogen. And then that nitrogen is attached to another nitrogen, and it's attached to two hydrogens as well. Um, and so the presence of all of these hydrogens attached to nitrogen mean that hydrazine will have hydrogen bonding. This question asks us to identify the compound that has the highest melting point. Uh, highest melting point means that it has the strongest intermolecular forces. And so we need to identify when intermolecular forces are present. You might want to pause this video and take a moment to see if you can identify what molecular forces are present here. Okay, so 
So now that you've taken a moment to determine that, um, I think what you'll have found is that London dispersion forces are the dominant intermolecular force in all of these compounds. They are all composed entirely of carbon and hydrogen. Uh, that means that there's nothing polar anywhere in them, and so that will all be London dispersion forces. So now we've got to look at those three things that affected the strength of um, London dispersion forces. There was polarizability, there was the number of atoms in the molecule, and there was um, goodness, what was the third one? Well, anyway, go back and look at the notes, see what that third factor was. In this case, oh, it was the shape of molecules, linear versus spherical. In this case, they're all linear. They're all written out as chains. Um, in these kinds of structural formulas, you start with a CH3 group, which gives you the uh, CH3, like we were drawing in those earlier molecules. And then you have varying numbers of CH2s, which would be a carbon with two hydrogens bonded to it. And then you, you, you have varying numbers of those CH2 groups, and then you end with a CH3. Um, so the thing that's different in all of these is how many atoms you have. Um, the more atoms you have, the more electrons you have, the more polarizable it becomes. And so you, the more atoms you have, the stronger those intermolecular forces will be. And so the biggest molecule will be the one that has the highest melting point. This question could also have been phrased, which has the highest melting point, which one has the highest boiling point, which one has the highest viscosity. We would use the same argument for all of those questions. The one with the um, greatest London dispersion forces um, would be the longest molecule, um, and that would uh, be the correct answer. The dominant intermolecular force here in acetic acid well, um, I'm not seeing an ion anywhere, so this is not going to be ion dipole, but I do see an oxygen uh, bonded to a hydrogen, which means it's going to be hydrogen bonding. This question asks us to rank these in order of increasing boiling point. So that's going to mean in order of increasing strength of intermolecular forces. So from the weakest to the strongest. Um, so let's identify what we have in each of these. Uh, barium chloride, that is going to be an ionic compound because it is um, a metal plus a nonmetal. So being ionic, that's going to be a bond that's going to be stronger than any of our intermolecular forces. So we already know that one is going to have the highest boiling point. Um, so that basically means that the answer has to be D or E. And then um, let's see, hydrogen and neon are both going to have uh, London dispersion forces. And uh, since neon has a whole lot more electrons than H2 does, five times as many, um, neon will be at a higher boiling point. So both of these are starting, hydrogen than neon, so that's looking right so far. Um, then we have to compare CO and HF. Well, CO is going to be polar, so that'll be dipole-dipole. And HF, we've got a hydrogen bonded to a fluorine, so that's going to be hydrogen bonding. So um, uh, the um, HF is going to have a higher boiling point than CO, which means that D is going to be our correct answer. Wrapping up to review our objectives, we wanted to identify the dominant intermolecular force for specific substances. We've got a flow chart to do that. We do it from uh, strongest intermolecular force to weak and weakest in a process of calculatus eliminatus.